lot of people are asking about business structure. And so, you know, you got the sole proprietor, you got the LLC, you got the LLC with S Corp election. So here's a quick note, right? When you become an LLC, you have the option of being taxed either as a sole proprietor or as a S Corp, right? So that's why we, you know, when I'm talking to people, I kind of, I'll say LLC and like, meaning like a regular LLC that's taxed as a sole proprietor. But then, you know, once you get to a certain level of net income, you want to look at doing an LLC with S Corp election. So where you want to stop being taxed as a sole proprietor and you want to start being taxed as an S corporation because of the advantages in, in terms of being able to save a lot of money regarding self-employment tax. And we will jump into a detailed example and all that because I know both of you guys um, asked about that. But, um, and so those are now, so question. So with both of you guys, you guys are just regular LLCs that are taxed as a sole proprietor. Is that correct? Yes, I'm an LLC. Okay. Yeah, as of right now, yes. Yeah, as of right, okay, good. Okay, so, um, and you know, so I deal with like all different levels, right? So like even in my company, I have a lot of independent contractors. I have a, uh, it's like dance fitness business and we do like birthday parties for kids and stuff. And so a lot of my independent contractors are just like young, um, you know, college age, um, you know, students and stuff or like recently out of college. And so for a lot of them, they don't need to be an LLC, right? I mean, a lot of them it's like, you know, typical situation is that they have their full time job and then they're just doing like a little side business, you know, and it's not is not making significant income and stuff. So I kind of go over, you know, depending on your situation, right? You know, most likely when you're just starting out in business, you just want to become a sole proprietor, re register as a sole proprietor because it's easy. It's not like you have a lot of personal assets to protect. Also, the nature of your business plays a role, right? I mean, if you're in a business where you're not, where there's not a high risk of lawsuits, you know, you don't really need to go through all of that hassle to become an LLC. But with you guys, of course, you guys are making significant income. It's a, it's a, it's a real, um, you know, your 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 business is growing, and so so that's smart that you became an LLC. And later, we're going to talk about when you should transition from an LLC into a LLC with S Corp election. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it regarding business structure. So let's jump into this whole LLC versus LLC with S Corp election. All right. So the best way for me to do this is like take you through like a, a, an example with real numbers. Okay. So you guys have, you know, a piece of paper and something to write with. You can kind of, cause I don't know how, I know this is kind of, you can't really see my board maybe, but um, it's kind of small, but, but anyway, um, basically, so let's say, let's, 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 let's run an example of a, a business that's, that's doing a um, profit of $60,000, $60,000. And let's compare the self-employment tax between um, a regular LLC like like you guys are and an LLC with S corp election. All right. Now, hey, Vance, do you, right. Vance, do you mean do you mean profit or net income? Uh, oh, I mean I mean net income. Okay, okay. yeah. So, so okay, and so okay, so when I say profit, I was meaning where you take your gross and you subtract off all your business expenses, and then you get your I call it profit, but yeah, technically net income. All right. Cool. Okay. All right, so your net income. This is after so sixty. This is sixty thousand dollars after you've taken advantage of all of your deductions. I mean, like the home office expense and and your mileage, right? Um, and and you know all that. So sixty thousand dollars say of net income. Now, if you are a regular LLC like you guys, um, and that's taxed like a sole proprietor. So in terms of self employment tax. It's going to be 15.3% applied to the whole net income of $60,000. And so your self-employment tax will be 9,180, all right? And that's not, and, and so this is, separate. now, of course, self-employment tax is separate. On top of this, you still have to pay your federal income tax and your state income tax. And depending on 
where your business is. There might be some like local stuff, you know? So, you know, so in addition to your regular federal and state income taxes, you're, you're, you're paying self-employment tax of 9,180, right? Now, of course, there might be some adjustments here and there, you know, tax credits, blah, blah, blah. But in general, you know, this is what it is, right? So the, the main idea is this, is that when you're an LLC, you know, regular LLC, you're being, your self-employment tax is applied to the whole net income. Now, let's compare that with if you were an LLC with S Corp election, all right? So basically, here's the, here's the overview, right? Is this, when you're an LLC with S Corp election, you have the option of classifying a portion of your profit as a reasonable salary and the remaining portion as a distribution to shareholder. Now, the only portion, or put it this way, only the portion classified as reasonable salary is subjected to the self-employment tax. The, the other portion, the, the, the distribution of shareholder is not, is, does, does not like self-employment tax does not apply to the distribution to shareholder, right? So therefore, in this, our example, you know, say you, you know, net income 60,000, suppose you, now here's the big thing, you have to decide how much you're going to classify as reasonable salary, right? And, and that amount, it kind of depends on a lot of different factors, right? It depends on what industry you're in and all that. But for the sake of this example, let's say that you classify one third of your net income as your reasonable salary, all right? So then therefore, $60,000 net income, so you're saying that, hey, your reasonable salary is $20,000. So the remaining $40,000 will be classified as a distribution to shareholder. And so here's how that's going to play out in terms of self-employment tax. So then instead of being, instead of being, um, uh, instead of the self-employment tax being applied to the whole 60,000, the self-employment tax, right, is only going to be applied to the 20,000, the part that is classified as your reasonable salary, right? So then therefore you take 15.3% of 20,000 and you get $3,060, all right? Now remember before, you know, when it was just regular like tax, like a sole proprietor, right? Regular LLC, your self-employment tax is 9,180. So you see that from this example, the amount of, of um, the amount of self-employment tax that you're able to avoid is nine is 6,120, right? Because we take the 9,180, subtract the 3,060, and the 6,120 is the amount of the self-employment tax that you're able to avoid, right? Now, if you think about it, you know, this is per year, right? You know, so I mean, you know, it adds up. Now, here's the big, big thing that a lot of people that teach this stuff will overlook or not explain. So here's the thing. You got to do a cost benefit analysis. Now you look at this, you're like, wow, I can save, you know, $6,000, you know what I'm saying? By, 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 by transitioning to a, uh, a LLC with S corp election. But here's the thing you have to think about this. When you transition to an S corp election, there's more paperwork involved, right? Like right now, when you do your taxes as just a regular LLC, you know you're just doing a Schedule C, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not hard. But but with the S corp election, it's like a separate tax return you have to do. So most likely, you're going to have to, you know, hire a professional to kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, do those filings for you. Um, also, too, you're, you're going to have to do payroll, right? Because this whole thing about the reasonable salary, basically, you know, you are paying yourself a salary, right? And, you know, like this whole strategy is based on like you paying yourself a strategy. And so you have to set up payroll, you know, I mean, it's a hassle. So, so yes, you know, you're saving a significant amount of money, but you have to keep in, in, uh, you have to keep in mind that there are some additional costs that come with maintaining a, a S corp election. Now, those additional costs, you have to take that into consideration. And it's because of those additional costs 
there different tax professionals have different opinions regarding at what level of net income you should transition into a S corp election. Some people will, will say as low as like fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Like if you're making at least fifty, sixty thousand dollars in net income, you should go ahead and transition. Other professionals are saying no. Wait until you hit like one hundred thousand dollars of net income, right? And and it just it, it really depends on the person. Um, so I'll say two things. Number one, depends on your calculation of the additional costs that will be involved in you making the transition. And number two, it also depends on how much you're going to classify as a reasonable salary, right? Because remember in our calculation, we said, we, we assumed that one third of the net income was our reasonable salary. So, you know, net income 60,000. And so we're saying 20,000 is our reasonable salary. Now, in some industries, you might not be able to, to classify uh, a reasonable salary, depending on what you do, you might not be able to say that, hey, my reasonable salary is $20,000 a year, you know, it might be more. So then, you know, so then, then and that then will change your calculations regarding how much self-employment tax you can avoid. Now, real quick, Melissa has joined. Melissa is a uh, tax professional. She's an enrolled agent. So, you know, so you, you know what uh, CP, you know what CPA, CPAs are, right? But an enrolled agent in terms of taxes and stuff is even a higher designation. Like she really, really is an expert on taxes. And um, Melissa, I know that you kind of came in, um, but um, do you want to add anything to what I was saying? No, you're actually doing a terrific job. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So yeah, right. no, you're, you're doing a, a, a great overview at this point. So yeah, in addition to being a CPA, I'm an enrolled agent, which gives me the tax expertise on top of being a CPA as well. So, <clears throat> so guys, you, you, you guys, you are getting a lot of valuable free advice right now. All right. <laughs> so, so um, JJ and Harvey. All right. So I know that was a lot that, that I just said right there. All right. Feel free, any questions you may have. I don't think so. No, okay. I, you know, here's, here's one of the, um, here's a question. This is, this is some, I probably know the answer, but, um, you know, any of you can answer this. So obviously, you know, being in the fitness industry, we run on a subscription type of method. So somebody enrolls, they sign up and they get a once a month type of you know fee I, I also take a fee right so whatever they pay then a percentage is taken out from let's say the payment the etf payment processing company Are you with me one of the challenges that i have with the accounting system that i currently have in place is calculating that number e like efficiently Wait, are you talking so, you say a fee? You mean like a PayPal, like a PayPal service fee? Where okay, it's like so, yeah, if you're familiar with PayPal. So yeah. PayPal, for example, they currently charge a 3.9% fee plus 30% for every transaction um, under the business plan. So if you're on a subscription level. Now, PayPal was the old system. And that was, um, that's one of the, the challenges. So I moved from PayPal to a different system. Mm -hmm. PayPal had like every, so let's say Lance, we'll use you for example, you're an enrollee. I would see your, um, let's say, let's just call it $99 a month. So you pay $99 for gym membership. Mm -hmm. And then I would see the deduction right. of let's say 3.9%. Right. And then I see my payout. The new, right. the new payment system that we have, the only thing I see is the payout on a transaction by transaction basis. Now, when so you, it's new, new new system though, but is there a way that there's like you, you can dig deep to see what what the exact fee was that they took out? Or? Well, it's it's standard, so I could kind of um, okay. I don't. That's the thing. I think it's probably I'd have to go back to them. Okay. But like for example, um, like me, I'm always looking for the the I'm I'm a one man shop, so I'm always trying to look for the fast way. So for example, if they're taking the fee out, right. And they're paying me. Right. Do at what point do I need to show? Do I need to show that full income, or could I just say, "Oh, well, I'll just show the payout income." So here's the question. 
So, so for example, suppose the, the fee was $99 that you charge, yes. right? And, yep. and suppose that their service fee was, let's say, four bucks, right? Sure. So, so then therefore, $95, is that $95 the only amount that's hitting your account that you're seeing? You're only seeing $95, right? Yeah, I'm never seeing, the, I'm never seeing that fee. That, okay. The fee that they take out, that's, that's, that's basically money that never makes it into my account. Right, right, right. So then, so really the revenue that you, with your bookkeeping system, the revenue that you have to um, take account for is just the 95 because it's oh, okay. not even relevant because you haven't even seen it. But Melissa, do you agree with that? All he needs to care about is the 95, the amount that's hitting his business. So my answer is it depends. Uh, um, good <laughs> <laughs> and so technically, um, just accounting for the $95 worth of income that you have is sufficient. Um, and if you were to be audited, you can just show, yeah, here it shows, you know, $99 minus the $4 fee. And this is all I actually received. However, um, proper accounting looks like you would put in the entire $99 of revenue. You would have the processing fees show as a cost of goods sold. And this is actually going to give you a better, clearer picture of your company. So if it's just you, it's going to stay small. Yeah, keep it easy. That's not a problem. But if this is something you plan to scale, if this is something you're going to be working with other people, if it's something that you're going to be using to qualify for loans for a new car or a house or something, you want your... Um, you want to show your business savvy by having a proper accounting. And, and Melissa, it's easy. Like PayPal makes it easy because PayPal will, will show both numbers, you know? And so when you, like, if you have your PayPal connected to let's say QuickBooks and when you bring it in, it's going to show and then you can classify that. Oh yeah. That $4 was the service fee bank fee. And then the $99 is my, you know, service revenue, you know, and all that. But in JJ's situation, what he's saying is that he's not even seeing the four bucks anywhere. All he sees is $95, but maybe there's a way he can dig deep and or work. Yeah, I mean, no, and there's, and, gotta, and, be a, there's gotta be a way. Um, so there, there's gotta be reporting from the processor that actually shows what's really happening. And um, for an efficiency standpoint, the way I would handle it if I was doing the bookkeeping is <clears throat> let it hit the bank account as whatever's happening throughout the month and then do an adjusting journal entry at the end of every month to put the revenue where the real revenue number is and break out the portion that was the um, processing fees. So you don't have to do it on a every single transaction basis if you want to keep it simple for yourself. So. <laughs> All right. So this is, but and that's the thing. I so I I have um, academically I have an accounting background, and so um, that was my big thing was making sure that there was proper accounting for all those. You know, looking at like business from scale perspective, mm -hmm. and making sure that you have the here's a clear picture of how much revenue I have, um, and obviously how much expenses, and also gives yeah. a clear picture on. Hey, how much fees am I paying? I know um, one of my uh, one of my industry colleagues. They recently went to um, a an ACH. I'm going away from the credit cards. They actually started to charge your members credit card mm -hmm. fees on top of their subscriptions um, because. And when they looked at it, I mean, they came right out and said it. We spent twenty five thousand dollars in fees last year. Yeah. So we want to get away from that. And in turn, we're going to get better equipment. So, right. you know, well, so it's that or you just have to build yeah. it into your pricing. Well, they, so, they, I mean, they can fib too. I mean, I would want the 10, the 25. Yeah, that's a lot. That's like, I mean, when you look at a, a full gym that has employees, you know, that could be, you know, that's a half salary for a full-time coach. So if you recuperate that somehow, True. that's, that's right there. So I do like that. So doing a, um, an end of month adjusting journal entry. Yeah would be the best thing and basically you could say like okay so here's the how, how would that look in a balance sheet like so on the on the uh what do you call the the asset side it would you would adjust as in 
adjusted. So it's never going to touch the balance sheet. Right. Oh, no, I know, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I have an academic background, not an applied background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that it, it's it's reclassifying items on the profit and loss is what it's doing. So okay. there is there is no balance sheet adjustment whatsoever. You're simply doing a, um, if you've got the bank feeds happening and it's all putting in the 95, 95, 95, <clears throat> then you're going to do an adjusting journal entry for increasing revenue by four dollars and in, then taking and putting in an expense in to counteract that so it still okay. comes out to zero yeah right. so 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 basically what that makes sense. you're saying is at the end of the month right suppose that you get a report from them and and, and suppose that they say that the total fees that they took out let's say was um Eight hundred dollars, say, all right, just for you know math. Okay, so suppose the total fees were eight hundred dollars. Then basically, what you would do is you would just increase for for that month. You would increase your revenue by eight hundred dollars, but also um, uh, record a, a bank fee uh, expense of eight hundred dollars. So it kind of balances out. But the benefit of that is that now you are showing that you really did make more money than, you know, what you, you had been reporting. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 All right. Yeah. I'm kind of just looking, I'm actually, while we're, I'm in real time, I'm actually in the accounts just to kind of see it is relatively new. Okay. Uh, doing it this way. So yeah. yeah. If there's like a quick stop, but I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Yeah. What I see, like if I go to the actual ETF, all I see is the actual payouts. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So I'm um, sure that there's somewhere on, on yeah. your account where you could do a report. Well, I can just call people and be like, hey, yo, you got to you got to fix this. <laughs> right, 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 right. Cool. All right. So that was good. That was right, a good question. Let's move on. All right. So, um, so in terms of the whole S Corp election thing, uh, you guys good on that? You guys understood that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, and then I guess, you know, if you're listening, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, when, when, when should I make that transition? Right now, Melissa, uh, Melissa, um, you know, I was telling them about how different tax specialists have different advice. Some people say, Hey, don't make the transition until you hit like around a hundred thousand. Some people are like, make the transition as soon as you hit like 50, 60,000. Right. Um, Melissa, what is your opinion about that? Oh, 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 you're on mute. You're on mute. Uh -huh. There we go. Uh, so back to it depends. And the reason for that is it depends on what your goals and objectives for what it is you're doing are. And if, <clears throat> if this is a side hustle that, you know, may experience a little bit of growth, but you're not pushing it, you're not whatever, this is, you know, you're going to keep it relatively small, um, then the cost benefit analysis that you were mentioning about whether or not it makes sense to do the formation, um, there may be a minimum tax depending on your state, all sorts of things. Um, and so is, is that worth it versus um, if this is your new thing and this is what you're going to do and you're, I mean, as low as 30 or $40,000 in net profit, um, I'm gonna say, yeah, no, let's, let's do this because you need to get in the habit um, first off of establishing and building your business correctly. So it benefits you from that standpoint when you, um, your, your revenues and your profits suddenly hit um, places that you didn't expect it to go and you're looking for tax saving strategies we've already got the structure in place and you can implement them immediately instead of in the future uh, you know so there's it so the, the it depends really depends on your business motivation and what's happening behind it less than the numbers so all right cool all right that was awesome so all right so there's no more questions about S Corp, I guess we'll move on to the next thing about just the business flow, right? So, 
So, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, a lot of the independent contractors that I, I work with are like super, super small time. And so I just have them, you know, register with their state as a sole proprietor. And then, you know, because, you know, the, the, the trade name application is only 25 bucks and it's valid for five years and the renewal fee is, 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 is $25 also. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's super easy and um, super low cost to just become registered as a sole proprietor. Um, then you get your EIN number, right? Um, through the IRS, you wanna get your EIN number and then with that EIN number, you wanna open with your EIN number and your trade name, right? You wanna open up a business checking account and then, because it's so important to keep your business transactions separate from your yeah, personal sorry. transactions, um, right? Quick question for you. So with that being said, should the employees... Oh, okay. Oh, that was, okay. So um, uh, you want to keep, keep the separate, uh, per, separate your business from your personal, right? Um, and then set up a simple, a sub, very simple bookkeeping system, right? Um, and including like a, in, a simple invoicing system, right? And all that, you know? Um, and then monitor your growth and be ready to transition to an LLC when the time is right, right? So now quick note about LLC. Now, you know, one of the benefits as you guys know of the LLC is that is that protection, right? Asset protection, you know, the, the, the liability protection. But here's something that a lot of people overlook about the LLC. Really, to really be protected, right? You have to run the LLC correctly, right? So there's some people that they think that, oh, I just set up an LLC and then I'm good. But really, there's situations where a per an LLC was sued and the LLC did not protect the person at all because the courts did something called piercing the corporate veil. It's where they don't recognize you as being an LLC because you weren't operating as a true LLC. And so, you know, the person gets sued and, you know, their, their personal assets are, are attacked. So, um, so it's just, you know, just going back to the whole thing where it's like, it's very important to also run your LLC correctly. Um, any questions about, about that uh, business formation and, and stuff? It's, if not, we'll move on to the fourth thing that was really big about quarterly taxes, quarterly taxes. So, okay, basic concept is this, right? If you are an employee, your employer withholds taxes from every paycheck and sends the money to the IRS and probably also to your state, like in Maryland, right? You know, it's to the IRS and also to the state of Maryland. Um, you know, so you don't really have to like worry about quarterly taxes when you're just a regular employee. But when you are self-employed, right? Or if you have significant income other than your W-2 income, right? Then you may need to pay estimated taxes each quarter. Now, big question is, okay, well, when do I know that I need to pay um, um, quarterly taxes, right? Well, so here's the thing. Number one, here's like three different like guidelines, right? Number one, do you expect to owe less than $1,000 in taxes for the tax year after subtracting your federal tax withholding, all right? If your answer is no, then you're safe. You don't need to pay quarterly tax, right? You just, you know, pay it at the end, right? If, if you expect to owe less than $1,000, right? Um, number two, do you expect that your income tax withholding will be at least 100% of the total tax of your previous year's return, right? Um, or here's an exception, right? If your AGI was over 150,000, right? Or 75,000 if married and filing uh, separately, then that number is, you know, at least 110% of your total tax of your previous year, right? So if your answer to this question is no as well, I mean, is no, then you know, you don't, you, 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 you are safe. Um, number three, do you expect your federal income tax withholding plus any estimated taxes paid on time to amount to at least 90% of the total tax that you will owe for this year, 
right? If your answer is no, then you're safe. So basically, if you answer no to any of these three questions, then you don't have to pay estimated taxes, all right? Um, otherwise, you should pay estimated taxes because um, the IRS can actually charge you penalties for not paying estimated taxes. Um, Melissa, anything to add to that? Um, no, it was all fine and accurate. It just made me smile because this is the stuff that makes everybody's eyes glaze over and they're like, yeah, that's why I pay somebody to do this. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, and estimated taxes, we're talking about federal estimated taxes and also state, all right? So now each state can kind of, you know, be, you know each state kind of like is a little bit different, but here in Maryland, right? You know, so you, it's the, um, it's, it's the Maryland, you know, state, you know, so you can pay it through the, um, uh, the controller of Maryland, you know, whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, so it's an easy process. You go online, you get an account, and then you you pay it right. You can pay it, um, you know, right right online. And there's these four different uh, due dates. There are there are four different due dates throughout the year, right? And each one is the you know is 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 the deadline you know to, to to make that payment, right? So so and then so two websites, right? Number one is the state website. You go online, you pay your state quarterly tax, and then the federal is the IRS. You go to the IRS website. And same type of thing, you know, you kind of get into your account and then you pay that estimated tax. And then of course, when you file your tax at the end of the year, you will, after you calculate what your um, tax uh, amount is, your total tax, then you deduct the estimated taxes that you paid, you know, to calculate your refund or if you have to pay a little bit more, you know? So I know this is very technical, but um, any questions on this at all?